You may be seated all over the house. I want to invite you to the Gospel of John today, chapter 12, if you turn there for just a few moments as we study the Word of the Lord together. Twelfth chapter of the book of John is where we'll take our text. And again, I want to say thank you for being here. We not only welcome you in the tent, we welcome all of our many, many hubs as well as our many, many thousands of people that are watching now and we'll watch the replay later. Thank you for being a part. We do have an extraordinarily busy week. There's a lot happening this week, a lot of moving parts to get that many people here and on campus and parked properly and all of that. So do pray because we know that spiritual warfare will be increasing. And uh, we've already begun to fight hail by the acre, as we say around here. And so this week, it'll probably be fighting hail by tens of acres. And there's a lot happening, but God is good. And this is going to be a beautiful time. A lot of people are going to be reached. A lot of people are going to be set free. And a lot of healings are going to happen. I'm convinced that God has given us a global audience for a reason, which has nothing to do with Greg Locke or Global Vision, but everything to do with the glory of God of which we're going to be participating in a text and talking about today. And so please uh, be a part. I do want to give this one quick announcement. And uh, men, don't boo me, all right? We got a lot going on with men's conference, a lot going on with deliverance conference. We have more set up than we know what to do with. And hotels are already getting a little uh, a little weird. And so we have a little bit of a uh, kerfuffle in our schedule. And so we're going to take two Mondays without Bible study, all right? Not, that don't mean you don't study your Bible. You, you, if you want to show up at the Hilton and read your Bible, if you want to go to Hardy's and have breakfast, that's great. But tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, and then especially the following week at 6 o'clock, we will not be having our regularly scheduled same bat time, same bat channel men's Bible study just because we have so much going on literally from daylight to dark every single day uh, in preparation for all that the Lord is going to do. So uh, we're going to take two weeks. It'll be all right. Still be here, right? We're going to take two weeks and uh, take a little bit of a breather, and it just it's going to help us with all of the rooms that we have booked, and they have so much going on, uh, Miss Faith and her crew, to get things prepared at the Hilton. Uh, it, just about every hotel in town is completely oversold, and so I don't really know how they, they handle that when they're oversold that way, but there are no rooms available, and uh, so people are, are going to various towns. And so tomorrow morning and the following Monday morning, we will not have men's Bible study, but you can be assured we're going to have some red-hot preaching under the tent. Amen? And so it's going to be beautiful, so please... Uh, Remember that, and then just remember us this week. If you can't be here on campus to uh, lend a hand, especially on Tuesday, then uh, just pray for us, and we'll say more on Wednesday night about the final stretch of all the preparations. All right, that's enough chit-chat. Let's get to the Word of the Lord. John chapter number 12. I'm going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 23, but let's pray, and then we'll see what the Lord has for us. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of standing here on this platform with this microphone before these my friends to declare, thus saith the Lord. And Father, I am confessing to you and before these and this crowd and online that if anything today is going to accomplish eternal value, you're going to have to do it because I can't. So empty me of Greg Locke. Fill me to overflowing with great wisdom and power and passion from the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we want you, as this text will signify, to be honored, to be glorified in all that we say and all that we do. We thank you for a time of sweet worship. But now, Lord, as your word says, we worship you in spirit and in truth. You've increased the level of our spirit as we've worshiped. Now increase the level of our truth as we look into the word of God. Remove distractions. Soften our hearts, clear our minds, change our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said. In John chapter 12, you have a very interesting context that begins to unfold and untwist itself for various reasons, of which I don't have time to give you the whole historical backdrop nor the narrative, but this I will say. Jesus is preaching to a mixed multitude in this passage for one of the first and only times in his public ministry. 
You see, the Bible says in John chapter 1 that Jesus came unto his own, referring to the Jewish nation, and his own received him not. So because of the blindness in part of Israel, he says, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. And so in this context, we know that Jesus was going about doing good works by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was reaching his brethren. He was reaching his people, proving himself through words and works to be the very Messiah. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53 fulfilled. And so while Jesus was doing that, here's what happens. He went to the town of Bethany and he raised a dude from the dead. Now, when you raise somebody from the dead, you have no trouble getting a crowd to show up on Sunday morning. There is no doubt. So in chapter 12, after chapter number 11, the crowds increased. So Jesus went from having big crowds to a multiplicity of crowds. And all of a sudden, like a stomped ant bed, tens of thousands of people were showing up to hear this man whom the Bible says three times, never a man spake like this man spake. When Jesus opened his mouth like the front door of a house, theological Niagara Falls began to roll out and the people were hungry. You know why? All they ever knew was a religious book of do's and don'ts and the scribes and Pharisees had kept the people in traditional man-made worship and Jesus showed up and said, I am the fulfillment of the Mosaic law and religion didn't like it then and religion still don't like it now. So Jesus said some stuff, get this, on purpose to upset people. Now I know in this woke, mamby-pamby, preacheristic society we had, nobody wants to say anything that goes against the woke crowd. But I'm here to tell you, a woke church is a joke church. Can I get a witness right there? Jesus said things on purpose to get a rise out of the people. And so here's what happened. So many people showed up that the Gentiles are like, hey, we want a piece of that. So a bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of Greeks, a bunch of non-Jewish people started showing up at the ministry of Jesus. And when you get to John chapter 12, you have probably as many Greeks as you do Jews all in this place, this melting pot of amalgamation. And Jesus is going to say something so fantastical that he's going to blow all of their minds, both Jew and Gentile alike. So notice what happens, verse 23, with that backdrop, it says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the son of man should be glorified now we're going to take our time for a moment you'll notice this is red letters not greg letters so pay attention to what jesus said he said the hour is come meaning by that my time is almost here the reason for the occasion of my visitation has come to pass we know the Bible says in Luke 19, 10, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Let me tell you something theologically that ought to blow your mind. Hashtag mind blown. You ready? Jesus dying, being buried, and gloriously, victoriously being resurrected according to the book of Romans and the book of Galatians was not plan B. It was not an afterthought. It's not like God said, oops, uh-oh, what do I do now? Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The gospel has always been the one and only exclusive means to have access to the Father. John 14, 6, Jesus did not say, I am a way. He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So hear me, red, yellow, black, white, tall, short, fat, skinny, hairy-headed, bald, Jew, Gentile, Catholic, Islam, it doesn't matter. You hear me, if you trust anybody but Jesus to get you to heaven, you don't go because the only way we get to heaven is through Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. He holds the keys and the exclusive passport to enter into the presence of the Father. So he says, look, my hour is come. Now, matter of fact, do you remember when he rebuked his own mother? That was a crazy deal. I don't recommend you try to be like Jesus and do that often. Hmm? His mother in this book, John chapter 2, showed up at a wedding where Jesus was going to perform the very first miracle that he ever performed. Which is interesting, and I, I'll get back to the text, but there's so much here you've got to understand the, the richness of the reality of what's happening, right? We, we've had all these books for years where people, and, and by the way, Mormonism is bad on this nonsense. They write these books, well, you know, when Jesus was 12 years old, history tells us that he raised a fish from the dead, and blah, 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 blah. Don't listen to that nonsense. The Bible says when Jesus turned water to wine at the marriage supper in Cana of Galilee, it plainly says in the text, this was the first of the miracles of Jesus. 
If the Holy Ghost went out of his way numerically to tell me it was the first one, he wasn't resurrecting fish, he wasn't making his lunch expand when he was in public school, okay? It didn't work that way. He wasn't mind reading people. No, that's not what happened. And so he shows up, he does this miracle. But did you know when his mother asked him to do the miracle, you know what he said? He said, woman, you, you better be Jesus. You call your mama woman. Huh? Woman? He said, my hour is not yet come. That doesn't mean that he wasn't going to do the miracle. It meant he wasn't there just for miracles. He was there for a message. And the message was, I'm coming to give you life and life more abundantly. Then later in the context of both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we find that the people tried to shove him down a cliff. You ever read that in the Bible? They tried to throw him off a cliff, but he said, my hour has not yet come. And he literally, the Bible said, had like a cloak of invisibility. It's the only way I can describe it. And it says he conveyed himself away through the people and they saw him not. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. Jesus did not show up to die in a water skiing accident. Jesus didn't show up to die by getting pushed off a cliff. He showed up to die the most cruel reality of a death that any man could die. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He came for one purpose, and that purpose was the cross. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, listen, and became obedient unto death, comma, even the death of the cross. Now, why does the Bible say that qualifying phrase, even the death of the cross? Because historically, in that narrative, it was the worst death that a person could die at the hands of the Roman government. There was nothing more painful. There was nothing more excruciating. So Jesus said, look, up until this moment, I've had a purpose, but now the true purpose is going to be fulfilled. That's why he says, my hour is now upon us. He knew that he was about to get betrayed. He knew Judas was about to kiss him. We don't have time to get into all of that. But he knew it was here. What is the hour that's coming? That the Son of Man should be glorified. Here's what's interesting. He is about to go through the most horrendous, suffocating way that a man can die. You know what Isaiah 53 Actually, it begins in chapter 52, the last two verses, and moves down into the 12 verses of Isaiah 53. It shows us that the reason the people had a hard time accepting who Jesus was is because they were not expecting someone as a Messiah to come and suffer. They were expecting a political overthrower to come and relieve them from the tyranny of the Roman government. But Jesus didn't come for the purpose of politics because our problem in America is not the White House. It is God's house. Can I get a witness? So when Jesus shows up, they did not receive him. And yet the Bible says that when he went through what he went through, he was unrecognizable as a human. And the Bible says there is no beauty that we should desire him. That doesn't mean that Jesus was ugly. What it means is he was so much looking as if he had walked through a butcher shop that he's not somebody you would look at on a wall in a post office and say, wow, winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's the Messiah. No, not at all. They would not desire him because of the brutality with which Jesus took the sins of the world. Does that make sense? And so he says that what is about to happen, he calls glorification. There ain't a person in this room that would call what Jesus was about to walk through glorification. But the principle of Christianity, if we follow Jesus, is this. Glorification only comes on the heels of humiliation. Because in the kingdom of God, we don't build ourselves up. No, no. We pull ourselves down because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. But if we will put him up and abase ourselves, he will exalt us and not have to publicly abase us. Because hear me and hear me well, upstairs, down, in-house, and online. If God has to humble you, everybody will know it. Better to privately humble yourself and publicly be exalted than to privately exalt yourself and publicly be humiliated by God. God loves you too much to let you think too highly of yourself. And so he says, what is about to transpire, he called it glorification. Verse 24, verily, verily, means truly, truly. I say unto you, 
Now, he's going to give an example of why his death is going to bring forth and manifest life. I say to you, except a corn of wheat, he's going to use farmer terminology because they understood that agriculture terminology, whether we do or not. He said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It's got to open up. It's got to die to itself so that it can take embeddedness in the ground, if you will. It abideth alone. Unless that seed dies, unless it goes through a, a, a metamorphosis physically, then it's just going to abide alone. It's not going to bring forth any fruit at all. It's just going to go on the ground and nothing's going to happen. So the, the corn of wheat must die. And if it dies, watch this, it brings forth much fruit. That's why the Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, that's kind of an oxymoron. I'm crucified, but I live. Yeah, because the paradox of the Bible is you learn to live when you first learn to die. You learn to get when you first learn to give. You learn to go up when you first learn to go down. Does that make sense? So he said there has to be a time that we die to ourselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily, not weekly, not monthly, not at the annual board meeting. He said every day I wake up, I look in the mirror, and I say, Paul, drop dead. Die to your flesh. Die to your desires. Die to the things in your life that keep you from the things of God. And let, let me say, although we're a full-blown deliverance church, not everything is a demon. you got a flesh that's bad all by itself. And so he says right here, there's going to be a time that if you're going to bring forth much fruit like Jesus, you're going to have to die. You see, everybody wants to follow Jesus when it's fancy, when it's fervent, when it's financially wonderful. Nobody wants to follow Jesus when he says, follow me by dying to yourself. Matthew 10, 38, let a man take up his cross daily. Shout daily. daily. Every day. Take up your cross daily, die to yourself, and follow him. Which tells me if I don't take up my cross and die to myself, I can't follow him. Jesus is not interested in how awesome you are. The American church is so lukewarm, lackadaisical, and powerless because we've been taught by these motivational gurus that God thinks you're awesome. No, God thinks Jesus is awesome, and you can't be saved without the awesomeness of Jesus. If you think God's impressed with you, you've been reading way too many books by nonchalant authors, but you never got really into the presence of God because you will never say, woe is me, until you first acknowledge holy is he. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, the great prophet tells us. And so Jesus plainly says you're going to have to die, and when it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Verse 25, he that loveth his life. Now think about that for a moment. You love your life. You pamper yourself. By the way, we've been taught that in the American church and really in the global church. I say all the time, I'll say it again. The biggest problem with the American church is it's far too American and not enough church. And one of the greatest problems, maybe not even a problem, obstacles, okay? One of the biggest obstacles a guy like me has in a room like these people that are looking at me right now in-house and online. The biggest obstacle I have as a biblical communicator is our lack of a biblical worldview because we've been Americanized in our Christian thinking. So when I say certain things, we look at it in the context of how things operate in the Western world. The Bible is not a Western world book. You have to think in the context of who, what, when, where, why. Who was he talking to? What was he talking about? When was he saying it? What was the context? You see, context is important because without it, you grow a cult. Because, oh, you know, I can just make the Bible say whatever I want to because this is what the Bible means to me. I don't care what the Bible means to you. I care what does the Bible mean when God said it. Second Peter says, no scripture is of any private interpretation. That means you don't get to say, well, here's what the Bible says to me. And then I get to say, well, here's what the Bible says to me. And then the next person says, well, here's what the Bible says to me. The Bible only says one thing, and it's what God meant for it to say, whether that makes us feel good or not. So the Bible's not a buffet. You don't get to pick and choose. I want this. I want this. No, no, no. You get the whole thing or you get none of it. Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have none of me. That's, that's abrasive stuff. But what he meant by that is you partake of all of me or you get none of me. So Jesus says to us in the context of what he is about to do that you must die to yourself because he that loveth his life shall lose it. 
I talked with a guy a couple of weeks ago, and he made one of the most interesting statements I've ever heard. He said, and I quote, Pastor Locke, I've made millions and felt nothing. Y'all hear me? Some of y'all, your whole desire, and I just got through preaching in Vegas. Holy smokes, there's a reason they call it Sin City. I ain't never seen so much debauchery. I say that. It's about coming Nash Vegas down here, praise God. Everybody out there, ching, 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 ching. Looking, 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 looking. Love my life, love my life. Want more, want more, want more, want more, want more. You're going to get it and find out. It's not going to make you happy. Solomon was the richest and wisest man in the whole world. You could take Bill Gates. You can take anybody you want to that's worth billions. You take Bezos, whatever his name is. Take them all. Take that Twitter guru dude, whatever, right? Take them all. Put them all together, and they don't even come close to what Solomon was worth. And you know what he said in Ecclesiastes? Ah, it's all vanity. It's like, you got more money in the bank? Guess what? You sleep less at night because you're worried about somebody taking it. All that stuff we love, love, love. We build our whole life for a fortune that the moment you die, your kids are going to fight over. And so he said, he that loveth his life shall lose it. I know people that have everything that many of you want, and they're no more the happy for it. He said, so if you love your life, you're going to lose it. But notice this. He that hateth. Now, that's a strong word, but again, in our Western mentality, it kind of ruins us to the context. He that hateth his life in this, notice, context, world, shall keep it unto eternal life. You see, let me explain it like this. The gospel itself is very simple. Salvation is simple, but for some people, they make it entirely difficult because they're not willing to die to themselves. Basically, Jesus says, follow me, suffer and be hated by the world, but you'll have riches of eternal life in the afterlife. And everybody's like, well, I, I kind of want it now. You can have it now. And the Bible says, verily I say to you, you have your reward, but you won't have it then. And as the old timers used to say, you've never, ever, ever seen a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse because you ain't taking a dime of it with you. Not a dime of it. You're going into the grave and you, depending on what you do with Jesus on this side of the funeral home, you will either be spiritually rich or you will be unbelievably bankrupt. And there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. And nobody wants to talk about that. But I'm here to tell you, it's the honest to God facts. And here's what Paul said. Have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Woe be unto these skinny jean wearing pastors that are afraid to tell people the truth because they think that people are going to leave their church. I'll be honest with you. If truth offends you, then you might as well find some cotton candy, Skittle, chocolate milk drinking church where a man of God gets up, let you live any way you want to, act any way you want to. But I'm going to give an account to God, not you, not just for what I say, but what I don't say. So I'll make sure to say it because it's in the context of the Bible. It's in the context of the Bible. So when people hate truth, they'll hate you when you tell the truth. You know, the media's like, oh, oh, he's such a hate monger. Then they sit down over coffee and they're like, man, we have a hard time hating this guy. He's not really the guy that we thought. You know why? It's not me they hate, it's the truth they hate. Now, granted, we've given them a few uh, acorns in their basket in the past to, uh, to, to make them have a public persona and a reality that this guy is not so schizophrenic crazy. I get it, right? We've turned a corner on that. But just because we speak the truth does not make us the enemy. The parents in this room that love their kids the most are the ones that will tell them the hard things that the kids don't want to hear. And that's why Papa can look at Junior and say, you know what? This is about to hurt me a whole lot more than it's going to hurt you. In reality, that's not true physically, but spiritually it's the absolute truth. And so Jesus said, you're going to have to hate your life. It means that you're going to have to have an abhorrence for what the world has to offer. Because if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, there's no value in that, the Bible says. But we got to keep going because all this has just really been meaty introduction. Verse 26, if any man serve me, shout serve. You see, that's the will of God for your life. Jesus did not die so he could serve you. Jesus died so that we would fully and completely unashamedly serve him. So we are just as called to serve as we are called to be saved, right? 
So he said, if any man serve me, let him follow me. Now, I, I find that interesting. I don't know how we miss that. I mean, it's, it's plain red letters in the Bible. He said, if you serve me, it's because you follow me. And we have people all over America. I love Jesus. I serve Jesus, but they don't follow Jesus. I, I serve Jesus. I will go to jail for my faith. The same people that say that don't even go to church for their faith. Well, you know, when it all comes down to it, and stop saying that, because it's all come down to it. Hell's about to kick the fan, wide slam off the ceiling, right? Well, when it all comes down to it, I'm going to die for Jesus. You know why I don't believe that in most Christians' life? Because they don't even live for Jesus. I'm going to die for the Lord. I'm like, really? When's the last time you blessed somebody financially? I'm going to die for Jesus. Really? You came to church last year on like Christmas and Easter. You're going to die for something you don't even live for? That's hogwash. That's in the Hebrew. That's nonsense. As Papa used to say, that's Tommy Rot. You, you are not going to die for something that you don't consistently, faithfully, and fervently live for every single day. You're just not. And so he said, look, you're going to have to die to yourself. That's when real life comes. Because if you serve me, you're going to follow me. You say, follow him where? Wherever he asks you to go. You break off whatever relationship he tells you to break off. You give away whatever he says to give away. You do whatever he says to do. Where you lead me, I will follow. What you feed me, I will swallow. It's plain. If you serve him, it's because you are following him. If you are not following Jesus, you are not serving Jesus. You are serving yourself. It's that plain. That's not Greg theology. That's right here in the Bible. So he says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. I have people all the time, well, wouldn't you like to go to Israel and walk where Jesus walked? I said, yeah, that would be cute, but I'm going to stay in Wilson County and walk like Jesus walked. I ain't got to go to the Holy Land to be a holy person. I just got to follow the Holy One of Israel, whom the Bible says was Jesus, the Messiah. And so he said, look, you will follow me, and if you follow me, then that means you will go where I want you to go. You will do what I want you to do. You will be the person that I want you to be. You will not be one way in public on Facebook and then fake behind closed doors. Because those people aren't going to make what's coming to this nation, I can promise you that. So he says, if you serve me where I am, there you'll be. be uh, if any man serve me, watch this, him will my father honor. You see, favor's not fair. <laughs> People are like, oh my goodness, I wish I had the favor that they have. Maybe follow the Lord like they do and you'll have it. Right? You see, I'm, I'm going to say something that's a little, it's going to sound a little abrasive. I'll, 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 I'll back out of the abrasive language that I could say, but uh, just, just understand my heart in saying this. I am sick of evangelical Christianity having become a peeing contest. Who has the bigger church? Who's baptized more conduits? Who's cast out more demons? This guy got on my Facebook page last night. You see that? I said something about the book. He's like, I bet I know more demon names than you do. I'm like, the name of Jesus is the only one I'm carried up with, right? I don't really care about how many names of demons you have. And it's like, I'm better, I'm bigger, I got bolder this, brighter this, yada, 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 shmada. You think God's impressed? Read a Bible. God don't care. He wrote a whole book of numbers. Ours don't impress him. Ours don't impress him. And evangelical Christianity, it, it's just become this big contest. It's become a contest between pastors. It's why you can't get anybody in this town or in any other town you're visiting from, pastors to get together. Because nowadays, the church is competition. No, it's not. It's cooperation. I'm in cooperation with the guy down the road, not competition with him. Now, if he preaches a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different faith, yeah, great. If he's a different denomination, big deal. Who cares about denomination? It's man-made nonsense anyhow. But if he's preaching Jesus, believes the Bible, we may disagree on a few things, but whoopee dee, we can still get together. But the problem is, we think, oh, we gotta be bigger, we gotta be bolder, we gotta be brighter, we gotta be better. Really? What if we pray for revival and God sends it to the guy down the road? Can you be happy with that? Most people can't. I'll be happy with it. Yeah, I'm glad for what God's given us, this great bubble of glory that we got. But if God sends it down the road, I'm excited for him. I want them to prosper. And so he says, here's the deal. If you follow me, you will be with me and my Father will favor you. My Father will honor you. Listen, you think he's talking about Joseph, the carpenter? No, this capital F, this Father. He said God, who was his Father. 
because he was subservient to his father upon this earth. Three and one and one and three, the one in the middle died for me. Jesus was not just the son of God. He was God the son. And that is a fundamental staple doctrine of Christianity. You take away the deity of Christ, you have a fairy tale that's no better than Disney and the Avengers. And so he says plainly, my father in heaven will honor you if you, here's the qualifying phrase, follow me. So maybe, let's just be honest about it, maybe your lack of favor is because of the lack of your following. There's your t-shirt. Uh, the lack of your favor is the lack of your following. And by the way, if you're following me, you're bankrupt. I like that people like to hear me preach. I'm my own favorite preacher. I'll amen myself. I'll sit right in the front row and amen myself, right? I don't have to sign books and sign Bibles. I don't have to. I'll go to the, you know, I'll, I'll get put in a hotel. I'll open the top drawer. I'll sign the Gideon Bible. I don't care, right? Everybody wants to be internet famous and it'll happen. So at the end of the day, I just want you to understand, if you are here for Greg Locke, you are here for the wrong reason. We're following Jesus. And that's why Paul plainly said twice, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So I appreciate the fact you admire me, but when I quit preaching Jesus and following him, follow somebody else. And tar and feather and run me out of town, right? Because we have too much man worship in Christianity. Man on his best day is man. God on his worst day is still God. And so... Understand, Jesus said, you want to be honored by my Father? Then follow me. Verse 27, now is my soul troubled. He knew it was coming. He knew it was coming. Watch this. This is a beautiful phrase. And what shall I say? Father, he's talking to God, save me from this hour. Now look at me for a second. I got to help you with something because it helps me to understand this theologically. Don't listen to these buffoons that write these silly books to say, well, you know, Jesus was looking for another plan. He was looking for a way out. No, Jesus was not looking in his humanity for a way out. He knew the cross was the only way. Because Deuteronomy plainly says, in order to remove a curse, cursed is everyone that dieth on a tree. And that's why Galatians says, Jesus became the curse for the world because he died on a tree. And according to the Mosaic law and the biblical tradition of what the Old Testament says, Jesus became the curse by dying for the curse. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, he didn't die for sin, he became sin so that he could take away sin. He became one of us so he could relate to us. We could not relate to angels, nor could we look upon the face of God. God had to personify himself in the form of a virgin-born baby that lived for 30 years and then preached for three and a half years. The only way we could visibly see the manifestation of God's presence was through the person of Jesus. That's it. That's it. So plain in the Bible. So when he says, Father, save me from this hour, he's not saying, well, there's got to be another way. No, no, no. Jesus knew what was coming. And there is nothing theologically wrong with the fact that he dreaded what was coming. Now, by the way, the physical antagonization and mutilation of his body was not at all. Follow me here. It was not what Jesus was bothered by. It wasn't the fact that he knew he was going to suffer. He was the lamb slain before the foundation. He knew that they were going to spit on him, rebuke him, put a crown of thorns on his head, fall down, put a purple robe of mockery, hail the king of the Jews. He knew all of that. What he dreaded was when he made this phrase on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. A fulfillment of Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, listen, I'm going to slow down for a, for a purpose because this is so important what's about to come out of my mouth and I don't want to theologically hodgepodge this. When he uses the phrase Elohim, it is the plural form, the plural pronunciation of the name of God. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Let us make man in our image. He uses the plural form. So when he says, my God, my God, 
It's the same thing David prophetically said in a messianic psalm when he had no idea what he was even saying through the works of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 1 is very plain about that. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. He said, my God, Father, my God, Holy Spirit, why have you forsaken me? So listen to me, this is crazy. For the first time in all of human history and the only time in eternal history and eternal future. The Trinity, in one fell swoop, was broken. Listen. Jesus did not say, my father, my father. He said, my God, my God. It is the only time he ever called his father God. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. I must be about my father's business. I and my father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Father, 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 father. One time Jesus called his father God. Elohim, Elohim, my judge, my judge. And in that moment of the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament was, Jesus was saying, I no longer am going to refer to you on the cross as my father because at this moment, because of the sins of humanity, Jew and Gentile alike, red and yellow, black and white, it doesn't make any difference. You have now become my judge, my father, my Holy Spirit, my God, my God. You have forsaken me and God the Father and God the Holy Ghost turned their back on Jesus so that you wouldn't have to go to hell and God have him turn his back on you. Now you don't learn that in flannel graph. And he said, Father, this is what I dread more than anything else. My personal separation from you momentarily while I die for the sins of humanity. And Jesus says, well, as he said in the garden, if it be possible, let this cup pass. What, what cup? The cup of the wrath of God. You remember in Isaiah 53 and verse number 10, the Bible talks about the suffering. I mean, the horrific suffering of the Messiah. But then it says this, yet, comma, it pleased the Lord, all caps, Lord, that's Jehovah. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. What? You see, fake, woe, Jimmy Carter, smile, Christianity gets mad when I say things like this. No, no, no. The Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. Do you know why? Because it displeased the Lord to have to bruise you. Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Jesus fulfilled the wrath of God so you wouldn't have to experience it. He says, but although I dread what's coming, he said, but for this cause came I unto this hour. You see, that's why the Bible says that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy in the book of Revelation. Because prophetically, there is no fulfillment unless Jesus fulfilled everything that had already been prophetically spoken about him. And the, the multi-gazillion chances that one man could fulfill that many prophecies on one day historically is unbelievable. We don't serve a dead Jew in a Palestinian tomb. We serve a risen Savior. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus, get this, was seen above 500 people after his resurrection. That's a historical narrative, by the way. Now, look, I'm not real smart, but I'm not going to concede an amen that I'm real stupid either, so you don't amen that. But do you think about that? And we're not just talking about 500 disciples. We're talking about doctors, lawyers, disciples, believers, non-believers, Jews, Gentiles, uh, Romans. 500 people, credible witnesses, for 40 days saw Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead. Now, think about this. Just... Come on, class, put your thinking caps on. How many of you, like me, and let's just be honest, you have ever had to go to court? This is Global Vision. Almost every hand in this room should be raised. Yes, that's what I thought. <laughs> so listen, when you go to court, I don't care if it's a child custody case. I don't care if it's a, a horrible felony charge, whatever. 
Did you know it only takes one credible witness verifying their testimony against or for you? One witness can put you under the jail and at one time in this nation in the electric chair. One witness. Jesus... The Bible said had over 500 credibly, historically accurate witnesses to his resurrection. So you hear me. There is not a court in the universe that the verifiable eyewitness testimony of the resurrection of Jesus would not stand up in. Including our own. There is not a judicial system on the planet that could deny the reality of over 500 Credible witnesses, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Unbelievable. And yet people still deny it. That's why in Luke chapter 16, <laughs> interesting. In Luke chapter 16, remember what Abraham across the gulf said to the, the rich man? The rich man looked at him and said, Oh, go tell my five brothers lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said, Look, if they have Moses and the prophets... He said, they have the law, they have the prophets, let them hear them. And you know what that rich man said? Same thing a lot of people say. Well, if one went into them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said, no. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Somebody says, you mean to tell me if somebody was resurrected from the dead, people would still not be persuaded? Yes, because 2,000 years ago, Jesus was resurrected from the dead and we still got people that will not believe the credible testimony that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive and he is set down at the right hand of Jehovah God, Hebrews 1 and 2, to make intercession for you and for me in this room right now. It's really just, it's that simple. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he said, this is the reason I'm here. And I, I, I want to not hurriedly butcher the text, but I do want to hurriedly get into this part because believe it or not, this is really the meat of what I wanted to get to. <laughs> he says again, Father, watch this, glorify thy name. And let me just say, I get it. We're supposed to follow Jesus. We're not Jesus, but the application still stands true. If that's not the prayer of your heart, you're praying the wrong way. If that's not the dedication and the morality of your heart, then it's wrong. He said, Father, glorify thy name. In everything we say, Lord, in my marriage, be glorified. Lord, in my finances, be glorified. Lord, in my health, be glorified. Lord, in my kids, be glorified. Lord, in this church, Lord, in this tent, Lord, on my job, even if my boss is a jerk, be glorified in all that I do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Revelation 4, 11, and everything was made for the pleasure and honor of God. They are and were created. Your purpose for existence is not to make money. It's to glorify the Father. And Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. Now, one of the most overlooked exposures and experiences from God takes place. And I'm going to be honest with you. How in the world, theologically, have we missed this? Jesus was spoken to audibly by his Father three times. But we have only ever, and I say we because I include me, in 30 years, have only ever preached on the two times that we know about. And here's an audible version, rendition of it right here. We know that the Father spoke to Jesus at the inauguration of his ministry, which was Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, when he came up out of the waters of the Jordan River. John the Baptist, who after 400 years of silence in Jerusalem, there had been no tongues, no wonders, no miracles, no signs. God was silent for 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Or Malachi, if you're Italian. But nonetheless, he was silent for all those years. And guess what? After the silence, God decided to send a crazy preacher. I mean, God was like, zip, 400 years, didn't open his mouth, no prophets. Malachi was the last of his kind. But he predicted that one would come to speak forth and prepare the way of capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah. 
And then all of a sudden, one day, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. In those days, what days? Days of silence. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John 1, 29. And John seeth Jesus coming unto the people. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They had never heard talk like that before, ever. Jews knew nothing about anybody taking something away. They only knew about a one-year atonement. And the next year had to be done again, had to be done again, had to be done again, had to be done again. John did not say, behold, the Lamb of God that came to cover your sin for one year. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that is here to take it away forever. Because up until Jesus, for thousands and thousands of years, the altar in the temple, it only had one word in its vocabulary. Sacrifice. 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 It's all it knew till Jesus died. And when Jesus died, the Bible says that the middle wall of partition that kept man from entering into the Holy of Holies was torn from the top to the bottom. Not from the bottom to the top. It wasn't man-made work. It was God-made work. And for thousands of years, that altar would cry, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. But when Jesus said in John 19, 30, it is finished, the altar in Jerusalem learned a new word, satisfied, satisfied, satisfied. And Jesus fulfilled the wrath of God by shedding his blood for the sins of humanity. Without that, there is no life and there is no understanding of a worldview without that. So now God, after the inaugural of a baptism and then after the transfiguration the transfig you know outside the resurrection the transfiguration was the most powerful moment in Jesus's history as a god man on this earth the transfiguration and God said this not another this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear ye him the affirmation every son wants from his father and that's a whole nother message but you know why Jesus was told by his father publicly in front of Peter, James, and John, and Moses and Elijah. This is my beloved son. Because Peter, James, and John got so freaked out, they looked at Elijah and Moses and said, oh, whew, it's good that we're here, Jesus. Let's build tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And the voice of God said, this, not them. They're prophets. This is the Messiah. This is my beloved son in whom I will please hear him. Those are the two times, baptism and transfiguration, that God spoke out loud that we know about to Jesus so people could hear it. And here's one we never talk about. Look at the Bible. I just caught this a couple weeks ago. It's amazing how the Bible can just come to life when you pay attention to it. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and we'll glorify it again. I'm going to be very reverent in how I say what's about to come out of my mouth. But if I can simplify that phrase, here's what God the Father just said. Yep, I did it once, and I'm going to do it again. That's what he said. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again, knowing what was coming. Knowing what was about to transpire, God's voice came out of heaven. We all know baptism, transfiguration. Why do we not know this one? The voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Two times we know of. One time we choose to ignore because maybe it's not as King James flamboyant and as obvious to us. But the one time that we ignore that God spoke out loud so people could hear it, as we'll see in the context, he spoke in such a demonstrative way, and the only thing he talked about was the purpose of our entire existence, bringing glory to himself. Your life's not about you. If it is, you're boring. Dear God in heaven, you are boring if you live your whole life for you. That's why when you die to yourself and you glorify God, he said, I've done it before, I'll do it again. I'm going to glorify myself through my people. He was about to do it through the gospel, and then he was about to do it again. When Jesus went to heaven, he said, when I go to heaven, I'm going to send the paracletos. 
I'm going to send the paraclete. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who, when I go to my Father, he will come and he will speak in my name. Because when I go to my Father, he shall come to you. And because I go to my Father and the Holy Ghost comes and descends upon you, Acts chapter number 2, the Bible says, then you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And that's why in John 14, he said, when I go to my Father and the Holy Spirit comes to you, greater shall greater. He said, greater work shall ye do than I have done. Greater work shall you do than I have done. And there's a whole message on that. I've preached it before. I'll preach it again sometime. But watch how audible it was. Verse 29. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, they heard the voice of God. Said that it thundered. I like that. Hmm. You can know the voice of God by how demonstrative it is. Oh, he can speak in a still, small voice. But that doesn't mean he speaks in a wimpy lisp and just suggests how you ought to live your life. No, he speaks in thunder and commands how you ought to live your life. And he plainly spoke, and the people said, It thundered. It's amazing to me how many people say silly things like this. Well, you know, I just, I just don't know if God speaks to me. Maybe I'm saved. Maybe I'm not. Stop that. Quit word cursing yourself. If God speaks, you'll know it. And I'm not talking about audible voice. There'll only be a couple of times in your life, if that, that you hear the audible voice of God. But I'm talking about when a sweet Holy Spirit of God speaks to your, you know it. He'll wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Bam, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You're like, oh, my goodness, I wish I could go back to sleep. God says, oh, my goodness, I woke you up so we could talk. Yeah. Quit hitting that snooze button and just get up. Get some coffee and say, all right, God, what do you got to say? He wants to thunder something to your heart. Yeah. Thunder something. It's amazing that some of those disciples that had a more demonstrative voice, kind of like ours, they were called the sons of thunder. It's amazing in the book of Revelation in the last days when God begins to formulate a time when Jesus will return again for his spotless pride. The Bible says that God will speak with many thunderings and lightnings. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And they heard it and they said it was thunder. Others said an angel spake to him. So some of them were a little confused. They're like, well, you know, probably wasn't the father. You know, it was, it was an angel. You, you remember uh, in the book of John earlier or, or later in chapter 19, they said, oh, he's calling for Elijah. He's calling for one of the prophets. And so people just didn't get it. And what's crazy to me is I know people that have been in church their whole life that far from Jesus and still don't get it. They just heard the voice of the father. And they're like, well, you know, it's probably an angel. Some of you need to discern the voice of God in your life. Listen, I love you as your friend and shepherd to teach you something right now. Some of you stay confused because you listen to the voice of internet preachers. And because of that, you are inhibited from listening to the voice of God. Listen, we're not always going to agree. Me and my friends, even some that come to this conference, are not always going to agree. But you better learn to decipher God's voice in your life. You know, one of the ways... I know God's about to kick the doors off during this deliverance conference and do some unbelievable things. Can I talk a minute, baby? Is that all right? Amen. Thank you. If my wife ain't nervous, y'all look out. I ain't never seen so much division in the body of Christ. It's sickening. Sickening. And I'm not just talking about people that we got coming to the conference because, you know, it's not that they're divisive. But the devil has sown division. You see, when deliverance ministry exploded, the devil's like, ah, crap. So he started turning all the deliverance ministers on each other. Started turning us against each other. And now we go, oh, I don't like this person. I don't like this video. I don't like this. Let's do a hit piece, blah, blah, blah. And now sometimes the people that had their lives destroyed because of internet theologians have now become internet theologians doing videos against everybody. And there's a lack of unity in the body of Christ. You know why? Because we're so busy listening to what man has to say, we're not busy enough listening to what God has to say. I want the voice of God to be so thunderous in my life, I don't give two flips what my friends think. 
I don't care what you think. I don't care what the media thinks. Fox News, CNN, they're all in bed together. Don't bother me. I want to hear the thunder and lightning of the voice of God. Because when I hear God speak, what you say does not sway me. It doesn't bother me. Now, I know, I know there's safety in a multitude of counselors. I take counsel in a lot of people. But listen, at the end of the day, learn to decipher the voice of God. Because some of you are confused and you think, oh, I'm hearing from God. No, you're just hearing from somebody on the internet that you admire and worship far too much. And I don't care how much you admire him. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, you better stop listening to him. Everybody all right? You'll know God's voice. It won't sound like mine. It won't sound like Dr. Bottle Stopper and Sister Wigglejaw. It'll sound like God. You'll know it. And usually when he speaks, it ain't going to be some little easy mamby-pamby thing that you can pull off. It's going to be like, mm, really? You didn't got to ask. Is that you, God? Because you're like, yep, it is. It's the Lord. <laughs> What do with them readers? Here they are. Praise God. <laughs> the people, therefore, that stood by heard it. They said, it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Now watch this. We're about done. Well, we're not done. Just going to quit. Jesus answered and said, this voice, I love this, came not because of me, but for your sakes. He's like, look, I hear my daddy talking to me every day, he says. I speak to my father every day. Father, 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 father. Except one time, call him God. But he said, this voice was not for my sake, but for your sake that stood by. He said, I wanted you to hear the voice of God. It wasn't for me. By the way, remember when Jesus in the previous chapter, now we don't hear the audible voice of God, but we hear the audible voice of Jesus speaking to him. He prays out loud, and he says just before he resurrects Lazarus from the dead, he said, Lord, I know that thou hearest me, but for the people that stand by me, I say these things unto you. So Jesus would talk out loud when he was praying to the Father, not because you could answer the prayer or they could answer the prayer. Only God could answer the prayer, but he wanted people to hear him talk to God. And let me just throw in the Jake breaks and say this. Some of you just need to talk to God like you talk to a person. Quit trying to be all King James and impressive. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thou knowest. Listen, you ain't got to quote the Bible to him. He wrote it. You know one of the biggest problems with the scribes, the Pharisees, and the hypocrites of the New Testament? Jesus said they make long prayers, for they think that for their long praying they shall be heard. And we try to put THs on the end of everything to sound all cute and King James-like. Thou knowest, O oh Lord of the heavens... That thy son here before you in the black shoes, black pants, and black and red shirt. How I need us forth the... Lord, I'm in a pickle. I can't pay my bills. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I break off them word curses been spoken against me. I need your favor, Lord. I'm in a mess. Quit all this impressing God nonsense. God ain't impressed by your much speaking. He's just not, I think he's more impressed with our lack of it. You see, prayer is a two-way conversation. Quit asking God for something every single day. Sometimes just sit in his presence and listen to him talk a little bit. Amen? So he said, this voice didn't come for me. It came for you. Verse 31. Now watch this. Now is the judgment of this world. He said, look, I'm about to do what I'm going to do. And it's going to be the very thing that pronounces judgment. Because I'm going to fulfill everything that God told me to fulfill. So the judgment's going to come. No longer will they have a scapegoat. No longer will they have an excuse. Jesus said, I'm going to do it. The judgment of God has now come to the world. Now watch this. Now, because of what Jesus was about to do, and he's going to explain it in the next verse, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You can't make that up. That's deliverance 101 right there, but maybe not in the way that we think. He says, because of what I'm about to do, the prince of the world is going to be cast out. You know what the word cast out means? It's a very interesting phrase in the original. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to teach you. The original phrase for cast out means to bring forward and expose. Which, by the way, is that not what we do when we cast out demons? We bring them up, bring them forward, and expose them for who they are. And Jesus exposed them and triumphed gloriously over them, uh, Colossians says. But... It's interesting. Here's what Jesus said. Because of what I'm about to do, 
He said, I'm going to cast out, meaning bring up and expose the prince of this world. Do you know what the cross did? It showed you how powerless the devil really is. That's why the devil, that's why demons get mad when we preach on the blood of Jesus. Demons get mad when we preach about the cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection, the authority of the foundation of the gospel. Listen, demons can't handle that. You know why? Because the cross proved just how useless and powerless the devil is. You know why he's so mad? Revelation 12 teaches us, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil hath come down unto you, having great wrath, comma, knowing that he hath but a short time. You know why the devil's mad? Because he knows he's going to hell, and he wants to take everybody he can with him. Because when Jesus died on the cross, Colossians says that he took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, he nailed them to the cross, to the tree of God, and openly defeated Satan... The Bible says, went to the heart of the earth, led captivity captive. Ephesians 4, gave good gifts unto men. We talked about that Wednesday. We'll talk about it more later. But then it says this. In Revelation chapter 1, behold, he is the one that holds, get this, <laughs> the keys of death and hell. You know why the devil's mad about the cross? Because the devil don't even have the keys to his own house. He don't even have the keys to his front door. Jesus has them because the cross made the devil impotent. And so Jesus very plainly says, what I'm about to do is going to cast out, bring forth and expose the prince of the world. Verse 32. And I... If I be lifted up from the earth. Question, when did that transpire? On the cross. Now, i, I got to give you some Old Testament understanding of what these people heard when he said that. Because I say it in American mentality. I'm like, eh. no, 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 there's no eh about it. This is powerful. John chapter 3, before you get to verse 16, which we all quote, we all love that, that verse. That goes good on a shirt and hat, right? But there's more to it. It's not just for God so loved the world. No. Up until that point, he said in verse 13, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Because as Moses lifted up the brazen serpent, brass in the Old Testament and in the New for that matter, is a picture of the judgment of God. And when he would raise up that brazen serpent, the Bible says they would look and live. Remember growing up in church, if you sang out of a red back hymnal, we would sing that song, look and live, my brother live. That's where you get that song, look and live. He said, if you will look at the serpent upon a pole, you shall live. And the Bible says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, if you will be lifted up, if the world will look by faith to the Son of God on that cross, they shall live. And Jesus said, when I be lifted up from the earth, when I am suspended between heaven and earth, between literally heaven and hell. You see, the bridge is what we call the cross. Jesus died on a cross. Yeah, but the cross was a bridge. It was a bridge from here to him. It was a portal of bloodthirsty goriness and humiliation. So that Jesus could do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He built a bridge. And he says, when I'm suspended from the earth, watch this, I will draw all men unto me. Now, I know sometimes we pray that, Lord, we lift you up today, and if we lift you up, you'll draw all people. We know that that's a universal principle in the Bible, but it's also a, a one-time interpretation that when Jesus was lifted up, he definitively made the statement to the rest of the world that I am not one of many ways. I am the one and only way, and I will draw all men unto me. I will draw him in unto me. When he was lifted high. Above all principalities and powers and kingdoms and dominions. When he defeated sin, hell, death, the demons, the devil in the grave. When he did all of that. Now watch this. Verse 33. This he said. Signifying. 
what death he should die. He knew it was coming. Why? Because he just said, my hour's come. Then he theologically explains it. Probably a little quicker than I did because he's Jesus and I'm not. The people understood what he was saying. But notice, we're just going to read through the final verses and pray us out. The people answered him. We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Now, by the way, understand that they're not using the context of the word Christ here as his name. It's not his last name. They're using it in the context of the anointed special one, the Messiah, right? Well, we've heard in the law that the, the Messiah, the Christ, the one that's going to come, he abides forever. So why, why are you saying you're going to die? See, they didn't expect that. They thought he was going to come and be a superhero and overthrow the Roman government. He came to die that they may live. He, he will come and overthrow the government because the Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulders, Isaiah 9, 6. So that's all coming. But Jesus did not come for a political kingdom. He came up to set up a supernatural spiritual kingdom. And so they're like, well, how can this be? Who is this son of man? Verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light. Why? Lest darkness come upon you. That's plain. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. He stumbles. While ye have the light. Believe in the light. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse number 6, there'll come a time that people seek God and won't find him. They'll cry to God and he won't hear them. Seek him while you may be found. Call you upon him while he may be near. While you have the light. Believe in the light. That these may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus. And then watch what he does. And he departed. And did hide himself from them. He dropped the mic, walked away, hid in some house, some cave, some black market somewhere, just went, <laughs> conveyed himself away, hid himself. Why? Because it's almost like Jesus had definitively and demonstrably said everything that was the complete divine fulfillment. I mean, in just a few verses, Jesus took the entirety of the 39 books of the Old Testament and said, in essence... I'm its fulfillment. Dropped the mic and hit himself. They didn't expect that. They didn't see that coming. That was a punch to the gut to these people, both Jew and Gentile alike. And Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And to this moment that is prophetically being fulfilled in this house and online right now, we lift him up. The Spirit of God draws people to the cross. I say this and we'll just pray. I read some time ago about a little boy that was lost in London. You can get easily lost in London. I've been there. And he was lost and, I mean, he had meandered through parks and neighborhoods and business districts. And he was out there for a couple of hours and finally he was just exhausted. He thought for sure he would be able to figure out how to get back home, which carriage to take, but he just couldn't. Of course, this was long before the advent of cell phones. He didn't know what to do. So he saw what they call Bobby's over there, a police officer. He saw him over on a horse, and he walked over, and he said, Sir, he said, I'm having a hard time getting back to my parents. I, I need to get back home. I'm lost. I don't know where to go. And so the police officer immediately thought to himself, Well, I'm going to play memory games with this kid. And so I'm going to ask him about a specific place, a specific statue, a specific landmarker, a destination. And if he knows where that is, then it'll be easier for us to figure out geographically which way he came and which way it needs to go. So sure enough, he said, uh, do you know anything about the Big Ben clock? And he said, oh, I've heard about it. I've seen it before. I know where it's at. He's like, well, if I can get you on my horse and take you to the Big Ben clock, w would you be able to figure out how to help me help you navigate to your house from that clock? Uh, nah, probably not. Been there, don't know. He said, well, what about a certain bridge? And he began to describe this certain bridge. And as he began to describe this certain bridge, little boy lit up a little bit and he's like, and I think I know where it's at, but it wouldn't do me any good if I was standing right in the middle of it. No. Well, the police officer went through four or five just random landmarks. Finally, the little boy, he said, wait, 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 wait. And he piped up. He said, do you know 
in such and such a park. We're right in the middle of the park. There's a big stone cross. And the police officer said, I know exactly what you're talking about. He said, that's a very famous landmark. It's a very famous place. A lot of people go there. And the little boy piped up and said, sir, if you will get me to that cross, I can find my way home from there. That's the message of the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. I can get you to church and maybe never change your life. But if I get you to the cross, you will definitively be able to map out your way home from there. And Jesus says, once I'm lifted, two things happen. The devil's exposed. And the judgment of God has full reign and full right to destroy the people that won't listen to the message of the reason why he was lifted. And Jesus simply says to some of you in this room right now, just come to the cross. Because if you'll navigate to the cross, you'll walk from there past an empty tomb and the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit will show you exactly how you'll make your way home from there. I want you to bow your heads and hearts all over this room. Thank you for listening so delicately. I know it's hot, but you listen so well and you're just such an easy crowd to preach. So I can preach three or four hours and never even get tired of teaching you guys the Bible. Thank you for listening in the midst of, of a hard text but beautiful indeed. If you are here today and you are saved and you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, then Miss Billy and the crew is making their way over to my right, your left. You can go ahead and you can get to one of these changing rooms that we have a little facility back there, a little tent where you can get changed. We'll have our baptismal celebrations here in just a moment. Again, it's believer's baptism. Those of you that have been saved, you've trusted Christ, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but you've never followed the Lord in water baptism. It's important. It's the next step of obedience. It's all throughout the Bible. Jesus did it as an example. In Matthew 3. So you can begin to make your way over. And I'll not make that announcement again. So we'll, we'll pop back up in a few moments and go right into our baptismal celebration. So if you're here for that, just go ahead and slip out. If you're here today and you, like some have already done, maybe you just need to come and fall on your face. And maybe you know for sure. You found your way. You know for sure that you're saved by God's grace. But the Holy Spirit has crawled all over you today and convicted you that maybe you have trampled upon a lack of thankfulness for all that God has done for you. You can hear this message today and it perhaps not even stir you but maybe convict you and say wow it's been a while since I just cried out before the Lord and thanked him for all that he has done for me or maybe just maybe you're here today sir ma'am visitor member whoever you are first timer or been here a thousand times even those online those in the hubs leaders take over right now Maybe you're here and you'd say, I've never come to the cross. I've never been saved. There's never been a time that I've ever done what Jesus said in his first message, Mark 1, 15. Repent and believe the gospel. In that moment, Jesus was the gospel. He was the gospel personified until he performed it, Romans 1, 16. And maybe today, maybe just right where you are, you need to trust Christ. It's not a set of words. A prayer didn't leave heaven and die for you, but a person named Jesus did. And the Bible said, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth right where you are. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus is the Savior. I believe he's my Messiah, my Lord, and I accept him right now the best I know how. It's not a set of magical words. It's not pixie dust being sprinkled. It's just repents, repentance and believe the gospel. And once you believe the gospel, the repentance will be proved out in your life. God will change you. He won't make you perfect, but he will make you different. He will make you different. And I know tonight we'll be having our deliverance and healing service at 6 o'clock. Hope you'll be a part of that if you've not been to one of them. But if you need some uh, help from the Lord, you ain't got to wait till tonight. You need a touch from the Lord. we got prayer workers. we got deliverance ministers all over this room that will lay hands on you, that will pray for you, that will help you. you. You don't have to wait. Maybe there's something going on right now in your marriage, and, and it's just boiling up in you, and you just need a few moments down front at the altar. Let somebody lay hands on you and pray for you in the name of the Lord. Then just right now, just slip out. You, you don't want to wait till tonight. You need, you need prayer for a sickness. 
And you come right now. You, you need somebody to talk to you further about what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Then you come now. You slip out. What, whatever your situation is. And then as those are beginning to leave their seat and get lined up and get their name tags and get their towels, just begin to make your way over. My wife's going to come. She's going to pray. And then I'm going to hop right back up just before we go into baptisms and remind you that we're going to need some help with these chairs before folks start leaving out. And we're just going to do it as a family. Just going to do it as a family. Honey, you come. I want to uh, share my heart with you for just a minute, if that's okay. I've been in this season here recently. I had this encounter with the Lord and in that encounter, I began to have revelation of who God really is. And I think oftentimes that, it, especially for me, that I could quote, you know, who he is, what the, the scriptures say, you know, he's the Lamb of God, he's the Deliverer, he's Elohim, he's Ralpha, he's Jawa, right? And I, and I think that we've, we've heard those things so many times that sometimes they just roll off the tip of our tongue, but we never really have a revelation that that really is who he is, right? And I've been in this season of my life that I've just been before the Lord and, and it's crazy because I've even said to the Lord, I'm like, Lord, I've, I've said so many times, you know, I quote Paul, I, I'm determined to know nothing among you but him and him crucified. But here recently, that's truly became the cry of my heart that I just want to know who he is. And in doing that, I've realized that the scripture that was just read, that's what makes it so powerful because when you lift him on high when you exalt his name there is glory that comes with just even the mention of his very name and i truly believe that we're going into a time that we have to have revelation of who god is that when you say, no, he's Jehovah Jireh, you know he's your provider. You know that no matter what comes, that he's going to provide. There's provision in his name, right? That when we need healing, that we know that he is Ralpha. He is the one who heals. That he's El Elyon. He's, he's greater than, than all the rest, right? He's better than the rest when we actually begin to know who he is. That is when he truly becomes glorified in our lives. That's when he's truly exalted, that we begin to walk and to live and to talk in a way that is glorifying to him. And listen, there's a lot of times that, that I feel like praying and, and then there's times that I don't and I'm gonna be honest, Today, I'm, I'm kind of struggling in my spirit a little bit with it because I, I know that without a real revelation of who God is, it doesn't matter how much I pray for you. And so I've been having this struggle in my spirit. I was telling Monica and the band a couple weeks ago, I've been having a hard time at the end of service because I've been struggling a little bit in my spirit about you know, I'm in this place that it's like, do I pray or do I just tell you who he is? Because in the days that we live, my heart is to just tell you who he is. It's just that you will know him, that you will know him crucified. Because this stage isn't about a prayer for me. It's, it's just an overflow where I just get up and I say, listen, this is who he is. And if you need to know him as something today, he's all that you've ever needed. So if you need to know him as a savior, he's a savior. If you need to know him as a healer, he's a healer. 
If you need to know him as provider, he's a provider. If you need to know him as your strong tower because you need somewhere to go hide, he's your strong tower. He's ever present in your time of need. If you need to know him as your friend, oh, he is Jesus, friend of sinners. If you need to know him as the lion of the tribe of Judah that needs to roar over your life, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. If you need to know him as your father, he's Abba, Abba. He is Adonai. If you need to know him as he that was born to take away the sins of the world, oh, he is Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. If you need to know that he is with you, he is Emmanuel. He is God with you. If you need to know him as the good shepherd, that you hear his voice and you follow him, oh, he's the good shepherd. If you need to know him as your righteous judge, he is your righteous judge. You see, there's power in knowing who he is. There's power in the revelation that he is the rock on which you stand. He is Christ the cornerstone. He is Christ the cornerstone. He is the solid foundation. Oh, he's the son of David. He's the very seed of David. When you have chaos, oh, he's the prince of peace. You see, he's the last Adam. He's the last Adam. And no matter where you are, whether you're in a valley or whether you're on a mountaintop, oh, he's the God who sees. You see, he's the God that sees you in your desperation. He's the God that sees you in your despair. He's the God that sees you in your praise. He's the God that places you on every mountaintop. He's the very God that gave us power and authority through the Holy Spirit. He is that God. He said, I am that I am. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the one who is. I am the one who was. I am the one who is to come. I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm your high priest. I'm your advocate. I sit at the right hand of the majesty on high. I make intercession for you.
We're going to go ahead and transition right into bathrooms. And we never dismiss. We just say, see you tonight. Leave the middle section for tonight. We'll pull out more chairs as we need them. Get some of our guys. I think we have some chair dollies over on my right. Pass the bathroom. We need these. We need every one of these chairs stacked up. We need to get them to this side of the auditorium. All right? We need everyone's help. As many people as possible. Just stack them, stack them, stack them. Go about five high, and we'll just get them all over there. We're going to do the baptisms. Band's going to keep worshiping. You can keep praying. You don't have to leave. Tents open all day. You can stay in here all day long. Rest, relax. And then while we're doing, after I do baptisms, while we're finishing up the chairs, I am going to go right over to the table. And uh, for those of you that did not on the front end get one of the books, but you want one, I'll be over there signing those books. And uh, you can get the brand new book before we, we'll, we're going to sell out at the conference. All right, we got 7,000 people coming and only 5,000 books. So they'll be right over there. And so start getting these chairs, leave all the middle section, and uh, we'll get those up after deliverance tonight. So let's move into a time of worship in baptism. Amen. Help us with those chairs. Thank you so much. I'll be at the table. I'll meet and greet with you guys. Then we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock.